Chairman of the Board, Mr. Alex Gorin. University President, Professor Rivka Karmi. Rector, Professor Zvia Cohen. Mrs. Tony Young and family. Professor Amos Oz. Dear guests, good afternoon. I am Chaviva Ishai, and I am the head of the Hebrew Literature Department here at the Ben Gurion University of the Negev. I am honored to welcome you this afternoon to this event in memory of Stuart B. Young, marking the inauguration of the Amos Oz Initiative for Literature and culture. This new and exciting program is a partnership between our university and the city of Arad. And in fact, at this very moment in Arad, 50 research students from our department with their lecturers are participating in a conference on Hebrew literature and Mrs. Tony Young and family will join them very soon. I would like at this point to call upon Professor Igor Schwartz, who is the head of Hekshirim, the Research Institute for Jewish and Israeli Literature and Culture here at Ben Gurion University to say a few words. It is my great honor and pleasure to open the Amasoz Initiative for Literature and Culture in Arad, a project we dreamed of for a long time and which is now taking shape. One day, or to be exact, at the last board of governors meeting on May 20, 2014, as it from heaven, and which the excellent assistance of the good people from our Department of Donor and Associate Affairs, the Youngs appears at the Eksherim Institute. There was instant chemistry between us, mainly thanks to the energy, goodwill, and warmth that flowed from the Youngs and their vision, which coincided with ours. This kind of connection between donors with a vision, a leading academic institution and a local community is essential if we wish to be a sensitive, rich, and mixed society. Amazon is for us a kind of northern star in a sky that is sometimes very cloudy. He serves as a bright point of light, a sane, balanced, and ethical reference point according to which we can direct our moves in the thicket of the Israeli reality. Thank you, Amos. Thank you, Amos, for the light and inspiration. Thank you, family young, young family, for it's both right. <laughs> Thank you all. I would now like to invite on stage the president of the Ben Gurion University of the Negev, Professor Rivka Karmi. Good afternoon. It is often said that the soul of a nation can be found in its literature. For the Jewish people, that seems especially true. After all, we refer to ourselves as the people of the book. At the time of its foundation in 1969, Israel's newest university began under far from ideal circumstances. We started here in Be'er Sheva at a time when it was still a dusty frontier town. We worked hard to convince professors to come here to teach and to begin to follow a dream to establish a university that aspired to take its place among the more established peers in the center and in the north of the, of the country. It was far from easy. We began by focusing on the kind of applied research that made sense here in the desert, both in deference to the environment and in consideration of the needs of the people who called the Negev home. Hebrew literature hardly seemed like a natural fit. So to have become home, 
to the leading department of Hebrew literature in the world, a post I don't make easily, speaks volumes about the university that we have become. The path we took to get here forms the backdrop to this dedication. And it is a story worth telling. Our beloved Amos Oz, Israel's most celebrated author, whose books have provided millions of people around the world with a window into the heart and soul of this country, came to the Negev, to the town of Arad in 1986, because the dry climate provided needed relief from the asthma suffered by his son. He came for the air, but fell in love with the landscape, with the pioneering spirit of the people who lived here, and with the young university that bears, bears the name of Israel's founding father. Amos joined our faculty and became the anchor around which a host of luminary figures in the field of Hebrew literature have gathered. Aaron Appelfeld, Chaim Be'er, Nisim Calderon, Edgar Keret, Igal Schwartz, that's according to the alphabet, not according to anything else, guys. And also others, two numbers to mention. Having now Chaviva as the head of the department is, to me, a huge joy. And all of them have made Ben Gurion University the center of the world for this most important field, Hebrew literature. Tony and Stuart Young, Zichronu Livracha, of blessed memory, also fell in love with the Negev and Arad. Important leaders in the Jewish community of Wilmington, Delaware, and active members of the UJA Federation system in the United States, they learned about a new initiative called Partnership 2000, which paired American Jewish communities with sister communities in Israel. A visit to Arad sparked a powerful idea and a partnership between Delaware Jewish Federation and Arad, and the surrounding Tamar region was the result. Tony and Stuart also shared a passionate commitment to culture and arts. Tony herself is a writer and a teacher, having devoted a lifetime to broadening people's understanding of Jewish history, both at home and abroad. She has filled critical leadership roles in the civic, Jewish, and Zionist worlds throughout her adult life, and we are so fortunate that she and Stuart found their way into Ben Gurion University family. And I thank you for that, and I thank the Ron Krakow for that as well. The Amos Oz Initiative in Hebrew Literature combines some of the great loves of Tony and Stuart's lives. The initiative will create an annual conference on Hebrew literature to promote the celebrate and celebrate the work of Ben Gurion University students, and they, as you've heard, as we're speaking, they're having their conference in Arad, and celebrate the works of Ben Gurion students, and also writers from Israel and from the Jewish world in general. It will be held each year in Arad, where it will draw participants, speakers, and aspiring writers, bringing both prestige and visibility to an important negative city which I had the fortune to live there for two years. I'm sorry, just two years. At each year's conference, prizes will be awarded to outstanding high school students and teachers in acknowledgement of excellence in the field. Uh, the inaugural conference actually begins tonight. So this is another point of, uh, of uh, conveying the spirit of Ben Gurion University. So it's not only within the university, not within the academic community, but also to the general community around us. The Amos Oz Initiative will also provide opportunities for continuing education for members of the Arad community who will travel to Ben Gurion University for programs and seminars with the Department of Hebrew Literature and with the world-renowned Heksherim Archives. The initiative encapsulates so much of who we are and why we are here. 
It fosters the university's cornerstone commitment to serving as an engine for regional development. It celebrates the unrivaled accomplishments of the most valuable person that uh, we consider among ourselves Amos Oz, and leverage his extraordinary gravitas for the further benefit and promotion of the negative city he used to call home. And it provides a critical addition to Ben Gurion University's increasingly important place as a keeper of this most critical part of our nation's soul in the Department of the Hebrew Literature. To our very great sorrow, Stuart passed away suddenly earlier this year, much earlier than we wanted. We are heartbroken that he didn't live to see this initiative in which he saw so much promise come to life. We will, though, aspire to make its impact and success a worthy part of his legacy. It is with enormous pleasure that I invite Tony, her daughter Anne, son-in-law Hanoch, and her beautiful grandson that are not here and, and, and right now is being uh, babysitted by somebody, I hope very confidentially. His name is Gilad anyway, and they made Aliyah to Israel, and that's another claim to fame of both you and, Tom, and, and Stuart. So please come up the stage and join me today. To Tony Young, marking the inauguration of the Amos Oz Initiative for Literature and Culture. The arts have the power to change people and to transform societies. Stuart and I both believe strongly that literature, opera, theater, film, the visual arts help us to find our humanity and help us to understand the humanity and the perspective of the other. Through the arts, we experience a different dimension of life. And we believe that all well-educated people should be artistically literate. When more people read and study Hebrew literature, they will understand the real Israel and the real Israelis, as well as the miracle and the challenges that you all face. We all know that BGU's mission is not just to give the best education and to conduct the most exciting research, but also to help develop the Negev. Very near BGU lies the city of Arad. It's a city I love. It's a city that 50 years ago was considered the gateway to the Negev. It's a city that has been home for many, many years to Amos Oz, and all of my friends are very proud to call him their neighbor and their friend. But it's a city that has fallen on really tough times. Our hope is that this new Amos Oz initiative in Hebrew literature, which will be held annually in Arad, will bring more people to this gem of a city which is filled with desert colors, evocative silence, gentle air, and a terrifically diverse population of Israelis from all over the globe who struggle with all of the dreams and tragedies that all Israelis do. I hope that the special activities planned for the students and citizens of Arad will inspire them and lead them to follow their dreams and to have accomplishments they can't even think about now. A very special thank you to all of my friends in the Hebrew Literature Department and the administration who have brought us to this point. Stuart and I were really excited about this program, and I choose to believe that he's here with us now. Todaraba Lakula. At this point, I would like to call upon our very own Professor Nisim Calderon. Two years ago, Amos Oz and his daughter, the historian 
Fanny Oz, published a book, Jews and Words. I would like to present some key ideas this profound work contains, and then use it to share with you a feeling that has accompanied me for several years. A sense that Israeli culture today is experiencing a period of creating flowering. We can and should be happy about this exciting flowering. But it is not only something to rejoice about. Because one of the sources of this flowering is a deep anxiety. But if psychologists have taught us that anxiety is an overreaction to an unreal danger, we must be precise and speak not of anxiety, but rather of fear, which is a healthy response to real danger. Sometimes we are very creative because we are very frightened. This book by Fania and Amos Oz can help us to understand this specific Israeli creativity and this specific fear. The main idea of Jews and Words is that the continuity of Jewish life throughout at least 2,600 years, which has amazed and continues to amaze Jews and non-Jews alike, was in fact a continuity of texts that passed from one generation to another. It is a well-known fact that Jewish continuity took place in the absence of some of the basic conditions of national continuity, a shared territory, a shared economy, a common spoken language, shared politics. Notably, we are one of the few ancient peoples who do not have kings on horses in our cities. We haven't had kings for 2,000 years. And while in Florence, the question of what exactly David looked like when he faced Goliath was of great interest, in Jerusalem, it was no interest at all. Our David, Amos and Fania Oz suggest, and they are right, is a text. I tend to believe that the various forms of anti-Semitism were part of the preservation of Jewish continuity. But continuity was not only forced on Jews. Many of them desired continuity, and texts were a central expression of this desire. The idea of the continuity of text is also in debate with the most common explanation for Jewish continuity, religion. What makes the books so beautiful is that it conducts this debate from a place of respect and with humor, but make no mistake about it. It is a serious debate. This book was written they state clearly from the beginning by two absolute atheists. They do not believe in any of the many versions of the Jewish religion. But nor do they disparage religion. They write that many of the leaders of the Enlightenment in Europe and many of the founders of Zionism in Israel committed a grave error when they disparred religion as a transient phenomenon or a worthless illusion. They stress 
that religion has deep roots in human psyche and that it contrib contributed to some of mankind's major achievements. Fania and Amos Oz also see the place where religion failed to enrich people's minds and improve their lives. The authors belong to the large group within the, the Jewish people who stop needing religion and stop believing in religion. They believe, as I still believe, that the Jewish religion, under the conditions of modern world and modern Jewish people, is not capable of maintaining the continuity of Jewish life alone. If you believe in the continuity of texts, you believe that Jewish believers and Jewish atheists can have a real partnership, not a superficial one. And you stop believing that the Jewish religion was one faith throughout generations. With a bit of a smile and a great deal of seriousness, Fania and Amos Oz remind us that this agreement is a very Jewish trait and that our ancient texts are full of very, very significant differences between a prophet like Amos and a prophet like Daniel between sages who found divine truth beyond this world and those who decided that the truth they were looking for could be found in social and emotional condition on earth, not in heaven. Our texts do not agree on the question of what the word of God is or on the question whether acts of God are just or unjust, or on whether acts of God include the burning erotic love of shepherds who had no time for theological questions. And the Talmud, they write, is full of disagreements and disputes. We should add that the Jewish world today is so varied in its different beliefs that the Jewish state has decided justifiably, justifiably, excuse my English, justifiably, I believe, not to write a constitution for the state of Israel. So the, cost the constitution won't have to determine who is a Jew. Jews have long argued, argued the question of what it means to be Jewish. And after the argument, and this is the point of the book, most of the arguers went home and opened books that also argued with each other. Yet, these arguing books and these arguing Jews almost always have maintained continuous tich, ties with each other. They were also sometimes very angry at one another. But anger, of course, is a stubborn refusal to break her away from those with whom we are so angry. Now, with your permission, I'll skip ahead from the books that we carried with us for generations to the books we are writing and reading today. I'll remind you that in Israel, the number of books published relative to the number of citizens is second in the world. First is Catalonia. And I would thank anyone who would explain the reason that Catalonians read and write more than Israelis. Is our production of books just an abundance of quantity? The answer 
clearly is no. Never before has Hebrew literature been translated and appreciated by so many other languages as it is today. Only the Bible brought Hebrew into other languages to a greater degree that is brought today by Amos Oz and Edgar Keret alone that sit here and by many other Israeli writers. And we are talking here about 30 or 40 languages, not two or three. But not only our books are flowering today. Israeli dance is considered among the best in the world. And Israeli films are not absent at any cinema festival that takes place in the region between Tokyo and Cannes. Fewer people in the world are aware that Israeli music is abundant and original, but it is not as known because as if Israeli musicians wrote, read this book by Amos and Fanny Oz and words that they integrate Hebrew words into the musical fabric makes it impossible to understand the, impos the quality of their music. It is only because of this linguistic element that the world doesn't know, for instance, that Rona Kainan, artistic level, is just as high as Shianid O'Connor. And I doubt whether the world will ever know that Zaguri Empire, a popular Israeli television series set in Be'er Sheva, is more original than most television series that you can get from abroad. I don't think that people abroad will know about Zaguri because without the vibrant, feverish Hebrew, full of Moroccan Arabic that has become Israeli, Moroccan Arabic that became Israeli, again, Jews and words, very little of the show's originality would remain. And I have not mentioned the abundance of first class in painting, sculpture, photography, design. This week, we lost one of the, our greatest sculptors <coughs> that is presented in all great museums in the world. What is more logical? What is more logical? than to explain this cultural flowering by using Jews and words, the book. Jews for whom words were so important for so many generations express the fact that words became even more important to them, to them when their language moved from the texts to the spoken world. And this is a unique phenomenon. This is an enlightening book because it says that the insistence upon teaching all Jewish boys, no matter what language they spoke at home, to read Hebrew, and the insistence not to forget Hebrew when, the, when Jews recited psalms in their distress, and the Jewish, and when the Jewish woman said the blessing over the candles, and when the Jewish family sat down for the Passover seder, meant that Hebrew was not only a language of book, books. Now, as Hebrew lives a full life as a spoken language, so live that it is hard for me to speak English, for millions of Israelis, what could be more natural than a flow of creativity bursting forth? And it is not what was in the Hebrew words that is apparent in this burst of creativity, but also 
what was not in them. If Jews had more text than other people, they also had fewer pictures than other nations. An explicit prohibition was applied to the Jewish drawing hand, and even more so to the Jewish sculpturing hand. Menashe Kaddishman, which I mentioned, break this and said, you know, all, all Christian world has this symbol of the Madonna. My symbol will be a sheep. <laughs> and if the words in the books and prayers of our ancestors were very Jewish and very original, they did not insist that the music that accompanied the prayers and the liturgic poems was ours. Each community took the music from its surrounding without any difficulty. The prohibition against sculpture and image, the ban, total ban, on women singing, the original text and the unoriginal melody, all of this explain the flowering of Israeli cultures. Jews continue to burst forth with a Jewish passion for words, but also, and no less, the burst forth to make up for what we lacked because of the Jewish avoidance of the visual arts and music. It's wonderful. There is a lot to read, to see, and to listen in Israeli cities, towns, towns, and villages, Tel Aviv and Arad. And I'm telling you, there are great writers and singers in Arad. There is so much that only a liar would tell you that he has read and listened to everything available. But it is not only wonderful. There is a great fear in this wonderful. There is a threatening crack inside many of our gems. Even an Israeli who cannot know anything about the flood of cultural variety can hear again and again great distress in the words, in the photographs, in the pictures, in the sculptures. I do not mean to enumerate here the reasons that the Israeli Jews carry with them the great Jewish distress from the murderous century, as the Polish poet Czeslav Milos called it. And I do not need to add for the newspaper readers who are sitting in this audio how much blood is spilled every day on, a, on the undefined borders of Israel and how much anger is spilled every day in the newspapers that, and in the squares that are reporting about Israeli society. But it is not this only what is reported in the newspapers, and not mainly this that appears in the works of artists. There is a fascinating chapter in Jews and Words on temporariness and timelessness in the text that Jews so cherished through the ages. The text of the Jewish people who have, as they note, a very long history and a very short geography display a special sensitivity to time. Jews and words remind us that the five books of the Torah are books that encompass more history than the sacred writings of the other monotheistic religions. It also reminds us that Jews knew how to maintain a very fruitful tension between what develops over time and what remains stable in the face of time's vicissitudes. Fania and Amos Oz do not forget the Jews have determined there is no early or late in the Torah. 
Jews knew how to include Moses, Hillel the Elder, Gershom Sholem, and Woody Allen in the same discussion, as if they are sitting around the same table. This was the stable dimension of time. But along with this was the desire for Torah innovations, Chidushei Torah, and a passion to lay new interpretations over old ones. Jews wrote words that carry within them a deep sense of time and a great respect for time. But Jews also wrote words, according to Fania and Amos Oz, which acknowledged the Jews who froze themselves in time and withdrew from time brought disaster upon themselves. I hear this fear in the Israeli culturing that is flowering today. Because culture and art know much more than newspapers know. Culture is a perspective of generations, not of days. I'm really glad that many translations of Hebrew literature appear in the world, that many screening of Israeli films, so that people around the world would know about us through our, our own works, and not only through what is written about us in the newspapers. And what is not written in the papers, say Amos and Fanny Oz, is that we are a nation of time, and that we have great expertise on the subject of time, and that we have experienced terror in the face of time. Therefore, we became the nation of continuity, unbelievable continuity. You can't have continuity unless you respect time. Again and again, an Israeli takes a pen in his hand and writes an original work because he is afraid that our Israeli time was frozen. He sees before his fellow Israelis, before his eyes, his fellow Israelis, who took their ancient text and started with Zionism, changing themselves in time, in history. And because they were Zionists, they wanted to do it independently and wisely in order to preserve the Jewish continuity in modern national world. But he also sees Israelis were frozen time for 40 years, having their major problems unsolved, not taking care of the great drama of turning many tribes into one people, not continuing to do what they started out doing so well, actively building a society through social originality, not only through military power. And all of this is taking place at a time when Jewish time and democratic time in the land of Israel is approaching a gaping abyss. Amos Oz wrote another beautiful book, A Tale of Love and Darkness. But in this achievement, in this book, I also sense fear, the fear of an Israeli Jew who was brought up in the flood of collective Jewish time and Zionist time, and he finds an icy stagnation in the ability of Israeli Jews to move in time, in history. Therefore, he and many others, other writers in the recent years have written their own personal history in the hope of preserving the individual dyn dynamics which were overlooked in the collective history of Israelis. This also expresses the hope that Jews would continue to respect time and not fall back into the illusion of time 
that has stopped. The question of what kind of future we are leading ourselves to, or in the language of the Bible, Anna anachno olim, whither shall we go, is a question that Jews must ask. There is a young and brilliant writer named Orly Castel Bloom. She has written a number of works in which appears horrifyingly, I must say, the term blistoria, which translates roughly against Jews and words. It's a special word. Without history, bli historia. Jews without history? Jews who don't take care of their own continuity? Is it conceivable? Is it not a contradiction, Jews without history? Is this not a betrayal of 2,600 years of life giving texts? Is it not more dangerous than the dangers reported in the newspapers? And it is a fear that appears clearly or subtly implied in many, many songs and pictures and books that are written today. Musicians, writers, and film directors are creating works in Israeli Hebrew, works that address a thousand and one issues of human life. But behind a great many of the works, we can sense a desperate effort. Perhaps I, the artist, with my love song, or with my photograph of the terrible exploding bus, will move something, move one stone from its place, and it will allow me to recapture it the sense of time that my surrounding have forgotten. I would like to conclude with the word which Shmuel Yosef Agnon ended, his very short story that he published in 1951, Im Knisat at the outset of the day. This is a story about a father and a daughter on the eve of Yom Kippur after a terrible war that destroyed their home. On the very day when Jews think of time as an eternity, Agnon presented time as history, as a war. During this whole day, the father cannot do a simple thing, find clothes to cover the nakedness of his daughter. And the daughter is trembling from the cold. This is an ingenious story written out of fear of Jewish continuity, which is in great danger and therefore destroys the basis for life, the duty of father to protect his daughter. Agnon taught, from teaching, taught, many writers to write many stories after him. And as I've said, we live in an age of cultural flowering, and this flowering relies upon all the past achievements of Jewish culture. But precisely because it relies on them, those who live the richness and the beauty of the flowering should not hide their eyes from the fear behind it. And we should remember the four words with which Agnon concluded this story in his special Hebrew. Eini mafriz ve'eini megazem. I do not enlarge and I do not exaggerate. I would like to now call upon Mr. Edgar Keretz. Uh, I was just asked to be brief, you know, so these uh, specific writers, uh, Jewish time is very short. 
Uh, uh, well, you know, f I must say, you know, I'm stressed uh, for me to, to come and speak about Amos Oz. It's a very uh, stressful uh, assignment, you know, because, because I really won't be able to say everything I have to say, not even if, if I wasn't asked to be brief. So now it's even harder. But, uh, but when uh, uh, Professor Igor Schwartz referred to Amos Oz as, as a North Star uh, culturally and, maybe, and morally, I can say that uh, personally, uh, Amos Oz for me was always an all star. Uh, when I, I wrote my first story when I was 19 uh, years old during my compulsory army service, and as I finished uh, writing it, the first thing I wanted to do was to send it to Amos Oz. Uh, my best friend, you know, said to me, This is really dumb. You don't know his address, and even if you'd be able to send it to him, this, he must have get f hundreds of letters, so he'll never read it. But I was stubborn, so I took an envelope and I wrote about on it, Amos Oz Arad. Thinking Arad is a small place, you know, maybe the postman will know the guy. I've sent, I've sent that uh, envelope and uh, uh, four days la later there was a letter in my mailbox, handwritten by Amos Oz, uh, with very, very specific references to the story that I've written. Uh, it was a letter that basically encouraged me to keep writing. And I kept writing ever since. So uh, I, my be I began my writing ca career with Amos Oz's uh, presence. And uh, I must say that uh, my father, uh, uh, who kind of always wished that I'd be an engineer or a mathematician, and this is was, uh, was actually what I've studied in, in, in university, when I began writing, he really wanted to help me and give me some good advice. And he says to me, what's your goal? And I said to him, to him to me, my, my goal is to write good and interesting stories. So he thought for a moment, and then he said, so m my advice for you is to try, try to be a good person, try to stay curious, and maybe good and interesting stories will come. And even if they won't, you'll, you'll still have a good life, you know? So this sounds like a good and sound advice. I don't think that, you know, all writers in the world uh, write a... Uh, uh, the writing or the contribution to literature is based on an en engine of uh, kindness and curiosity. But I can surely say that about Amos Oz. Uh, and I, I can say that uh, simply as a reader, because uh, if, I, if I just follow, uh, as an avid reader, if I just follow uh, Amos Oz's uh, books in the last 16 years, you can see there a, a, a novel written in the form of a poem, a novel written in the form of a fairy tale, a, a novel a, a, that is a, or a collection of short stories, an autobiographical novel, an essay written together with, a, with his daughter. I, I think that when somebody a, reach, reaches Amos Oz's stature, there is a, almost a, an infinite pressure on you to stagnate. Because you know, when you're a North Star, you know, you should just be there, up in the sky, not move, stay static, be a symbol, and not a, an ever-changing, curious human being. But I think that, that there is something very, very unique about uh, the writing of Amos Oz that all the time you feel that he, he keeps uh, seeking, and, uh, and when you want to seek and find something, you cannot keep searching in the same place. And with every book, Amos Oz reinvents himself, takes himself uh, away from the, his comfort, comfort zone to a new place, trying to find some a new answer or at least to raise some new questions to all of us. And for that, we are all grateful. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce our key speaker, Amos Oz. Dear friends, dear guests, Dear young family, thank you for warming my, uh, my heart. I am at home here. I have retired a year ago. I left Arad and moved to Tel Aviv, but I belong in here. I belong in Arad. I belong in the Negev. I belong in Ben Gurion University. I belong in this beloved department of Hebrew literature. That's why I am amazed why some of you insist on calling me the North Star when I actually belong in the South. 
Um, for all the many years that I lived in the Negev, in Arad, I used to wake up every morning very, very early, before sunrise, and take a walk in the desert, which literally began five minutes from my home in Arad. I'd listen to the silence. I'd look at the stars, unless it was a cloudy night. I'd listen to the crickets and the wind. I'll see the silhouettes of the hills. It helps me knock everything into proportion. When I came back home, still before sunrise, if by any chance I turned on the radio and I heard a politician using words such as never, forever, or for the rest of eternity, I felt that the stones out there in the desert are laughing at this politician. <laughs> and then I made myself a cup of coffee and I still do that and I still rise before sunrise and take my early morning walk. And I drink my cup of coffee and always by five o'clock in the morning I sit by my desk and I start asking myself, what if I were him? What if I were her? What if I were them? What would I feel? What would I wish? What would I hope for? What, I be, what would I be ashamed of? What would I prefer that nobody knows about me? What would I eat? What would I dress? How would I talk? This is actually how I make a living by putting myself in the shoes and sometimes even under the skins of other people, imagining the other. So the driving force of this aging writing hand is still endless curiosity. And let me tell you, I have always believed that curiosity is not only a prime intellectual requirement, it is also a major moral asset. I believe a curious person is a slightly better person than a person who is not curious. I believe a curious pe person is a slightly better family man than a person who is not curious. A better colleague at work. Maybe even a better driver on the road than a person who is not curious. Let me add, I believe a curious person is a better lover than a person who is not curious, but the time is too early to discuss in detail this aspect of curiosity. So, I wish universities will teach first and foremost curiosity. Intellectual and emotional curiosity, not just intellectual curiosity. Teaching literature, studying literature, reading literature, enjoying literature. And let me underline the word enjoying because people tend to forget this recently, that literature is a pleasure apart from anything else. The moral lessons, the social importance, the, the, the historical significance. Literature is meant to be first and foremost a subtle kind of pleasure. A readers also read first and foremost out of curiosity, or so they should read. You know, a reader finds in a novel or in a short story or in a poem two kinds of mutually exclusive fascinations. One fascination is the fascination we as readers experience when we read a text and we are amazed, sometimes even shocked. But this is me. This is precisely me. How could this stranger who wrote this text, how could he or she know so much about my inner secret being? And the other fascination is the opposite fascination. We read a text and we say to ourselves, no, 
this couldn't be me, never, not for a million years, not even if they paid me a million dollars, I couldn't do such a thing, I couldn't imagine such a, thing, such a thing, I couldn't behave this way. Those two contradictory fascinations are among the prime pleasures of reading, re reading and of writing literature. Let me tell you quite openly, I'm unhappy about the fact that in many literature departments, in many universities around the world, they teach these ways, these days, rather than literature, they actually teach sociology, or gender studies, or minority politics, or social philosophy, or militant political protestations, or the combination of all of those. The pleasure is left out. The humor is left out. The fact that tragedy and comedy are related to one another. You know, when we are young, we all tend to think, because that's the way they teach us at school, that comedy and tragedy are two different planets. They have nothing to do with each other. We watch a comedy and we shed a, t a tragedy and we shed a tear. We watch a, co a comedy and we laugh or smile. As we grow older, some of us discover that tragedy and comedy, comedy are not two different planets. They are no more than two different windows through which we have the chance to view the same landscape, the backyard of our lives. And sometimes they mingle together. In the best of stories, in the best of poems, in the best of novels, in the best of plays, tragedy and comedy intertwines. And this is what I tried to convey to my students for all the many years when I taught literature in this department. When I wrote A Tale of Love and Darkness, I had in mind a postman who used to live in our neighborhood in Jerusalem, the neighborhood of Kerem Avraham, when I was a child 70 years ago or so. His name was Mr. Maluach. His name, Mr. Maluach had a funny habit. On the outside of the envelopes which he put in our letter boxes, he used to write his own little messages, mess, messages to the residents. He never opened a letter, heaven forbid. But he would write on the outside of the envelope something like, you should never trust the British. They are treacherous. <laughs> uh, some, sometimes he wrote, you are being too permissive with your children. You are not doing them a favor. <laughs> and sometimes he simply wrote, your washing has been on the line for three days and the pigeons. <laughs> you know, for all those years when I wrote A Tale of Love and Darkness, I likened myself to this Mr. Maluach. I felt I was carrying a letter from my parents, from my dead parents, to my children who never really knew my parents, from my grandparents to my grandchildren, maybe if I'm extremely fortunate, even from my great-grandparents to my great-grandchildren. And on the outside of the envelope, I write a few things about myself. That's why I don't like A Tale of Love and Darkness to be defined as an autobiography or a memoir. I know the American publishers insisted, forced me, twisted my arms, my arm into adding the subtitle, a memoir, for the demands, the requirements of the Library of Congress. It's official. They needed the definition. I protested. I said, dear friends, the definition is in the title. The tale of love and darkness is a tale. And a tale is a very, very old literary form. Maybe the oldest. Much older than the novel. Much older than the uh, memoir or the autobiography. Much, much, much older than the essay. People were telling each other tales long before they have invented the alphabet. In the caves of the, of the 
our ancestors and the ancestors of our ancestors at night, surrounded by fear and darkness and some love, they told each other tales. So I don't like being called a writer of fiction. In fact, I dislike immensely the English word fiction. There is an equivalent Hebrew word, recent word, sipoet, which is the academic translation of the term fiction, but it only exists in, uh, in uh, no, fiction bidayon. It only exists in the academy. In Israeli bookstores and libraries, you will find that Gar Keret's novels and my novels and other novels, you will not find them under fiction. You will find them under sipoet, which means narrative prose. And I much, much prefer the term, the Hebrew term, sipoet, to the English term fiction, which means lie. I tell tales, I don't lie. I don't write fiction. But then I prefer Hebrew to English. Hebrew is my musical instrument, and I'm a hopeless chauvinist for the Hebrew language. I'm not always a chauvinist for my country. I'm never a chauvinist for my country. But I'm a hopeless chauvinist for my language. Let me not get carried away, because I can speak about the Hebrew language for the rest of tonight. But as we mentioned, the interrelations between tragedy and comedy the mutual penetration of comedy into tragedy and tragedy into comedy. I cannot help saying a few words about today's Israel. It's not a secret that I am very angry and deeply ashamed of the policy of my government about the occupied territories, about the Palest occupied Palestinian people, about settlements, about a variety of domestic issues. But strangely enough, even when I am extremely angry, I still love Israel. I love Israel even at times when I don't like it. I'll say more than that. I love Israel even at times when I simply cannot stand it. And there are, there are such moments in the life of even the best of families. I love Israel because Israel promised to take the following with a big grain of salt or with a smile. Israel is not a country. Israel is not a nation. Israel is a fiery collection of arguments. Eight million citizens, eight million prime ministers, eight million prophets and messiahs, each and every one of us with his or her personal formula for instant redemption. Everyone scream at the tops of their voices all the time. Nobody listens except for me. I listen sometimes, that's how I make a living. I love it. I love this argumentativeness. I love this, to uh, quote a title of an ancient and wonderful theater play, every bastard is a king. My, my, my colleague Nisim Calderon, my dear friend Nisim Calderon, mentioned that we haven't had a king for thousands of years. Everybody is a king. Every bastard is a king. It's difficult. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it means you are the target of insults and you are the target of hatred and you are even the target of threats of violence, most of them verbal, not physical. But nonetheless, this country is alive with endless debate, which on the surface is a political debate. But deep down below, it is a debate about morality. It is a debate about history. It is the debate about the significance of the Jewish heritage or the meaning of the Jewish heritage. It is a debate about the real purpose of God, if you believe in God. It's a, it is a debate about good and evil, political and metaphysical good and evil, with the participants of a street seminary by a bus stop in Israel, total strangers to each other, while debating fiercely about political and metaphysical good and evil, they are nonetheless elbowing their way to the top of the line. I don't have a problem with this. This country belongs in a Fellini movie, not in an Ingmar Bergman film, and I'm happy with it. <laughs> My friend and colleague Nisim Calderon mentioned the fact that for decades now, almost 100 years, we are li living through a period of a cultural golden age. 
normally people only identify a golden age when the golden age is gone, when it's over. Then people recall it with nostalgia and they say those wonderful decades of the great artists and the great creators and the great thinkers and the great poets. But I'm telling you, for almost a hundred years, since the revival of modern Hebrew as a living language, there is an ongoing cultural golden age in this country. And the achievement of the last 100, 100 years in literature, in, in filmmaking, in music, in art, in the sciences, in high tech, in inventiveness, those achievements, achievements are no less significant than some of the highest peaks of the achievement of Jewish civilization in the past. I don't think the city of Tel Aviv, ugly, vivacious, attractive, creative, bursting with creativity, I don't think the city of Tel Aviv is a lesser achievement of the Jewish people than, let's say, the rabbinical literature of the Middle Ages. Maybe it's a greater achievement. It's not for me to judge, but maybe it is a greater achievement. Time to conclude. People ask me, you are a great storyteller about the past. Well, that's my friends, not my enemies. They call me a great storyteller. You are a great storyteller about the past. Is there anything at all you can tell us about the future? Chaim Weizmann said, and I love this saying, he said many years ago that it's impossible to be a prophet in the land of the prophets. There's simply too much competition in the business of prophecy. <laughs> Having said that, I'll risk saying one thing. The story is open-ended. The history of Israel, the history, the history of the Hebrew language, the history of modern Zionism is an open-ended struggle. It's not a film. And you, my friends, you are not the audience in the auditorium watching the screen and waiting to see what will be the happy ending or the terrible ending. No, you are in it. And the decisions you make every day, big and small decisions, not just on voting day, the decisions every one of us is making every day, each and every one of our public decisions, professional decisions, educational de decisions, teaching decisions, each and every decision we make has a certain significance, maybe a teaspoon significance, but nonetheless a certain significance on the question where this story is leading. It's not leading to a happy ending. I don't believe in happy endings. It's not necessarily leading into a colossal tragedy, but maybe it's leading into a livable future, an exciting future, a fascinating future, a creative future, an argumentative future. Yes, I don't like the Israelis ever to agree with each other completely. I wouldn't like Israel to become calm. I'd like it to remain stormy. Stormy, but not bloody. Involved in fierce internal struggles, but not in bloodshed. Involved in everlasting verbal civil war over who and what is a Jew. Everlasting civil war, as long as this civil war is verbal, not bloody, not violent. I don't mind the Israeli Jews to remain in a state of, the, of an everlasting disagreement with Palestinians and other Arabs about historical right and wrong and who started it all. I don't care if we never agree about this, as long as the violence ceases and we start coexisting, not coexisting in love, coexisting in mutual curiosity and perhaps certain mutual tension. I like those tensions. When the hippies in the 1950s invented the slogan, make love, not war, I immediately realized that the opposite of war is not love. The opposite of war is peace. And vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, my slogan always have been different than the slogans of the pacifists in America and in Europe. Europe. I said vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, make peace, 
not love. It's not necessary to love thy enemies. Ultimately, our civilization, the Jewish civilization, for thousands of years has been a civilization of doubt and argument, of dissent and innovation, of criticism and of open-ended game of interpretations, reinterpretations, counter-interpretations. This, this has been the case in Jewish history, in Jewish intellectual history, in good times. There are times of stagnation. There has been times of stagnation. There is a danger, a threat of stagnation in the Israeli political and spiritual scene. There is a party or some parties of stagnation amongst us, and I don't necessarily mean political parties in the Knesset. There are parties of stagnation. But I always believed that the beauty of this heritage, the depth of this heritage, the fascination of this heritage, the almost erotic adrenaline of this civilization is the fact that the Jews never had a pope, nor could they have one. If anyone ever calls himself, maybe herself, the Pope of the Jews, everybody will be slapping this Pope on the back, saying, hi, Pope, you don't know me, I don't know you, but my grandfather and your uncle used to do business together back in Minsk or back in Casablanca, and therefore, please be quiet for just five minutes, because I need to tell you once and for all what is it that God really wants of us. Everyone knows better. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a climate of creativity. This, my friends, is the best of our heritage. Thank you very much.